What's up? <laughs> How's it going? I'm way too happy. I'm sorry if it's a turn off. Um, as you know by now, I am back on the internet, baby, on the interwebs. And I wanted to say two things before we get into today's show on the fourth way. Number one, I am recording a seven-part video series for my patrons called Vodka with Dostoevsky, which is a crap name, let's be honest. But hey, Vodka, Russia, you know, I just read The Brothers Karamazov, Crime and Punishment. I've read that before, but I'm reading it again. And um, many of you have been interested in in this stuff. And so I want to share with you a lot about my time away from the internet. And then we want to, I just kind of want to help you understand, you know, a bit of the brothers Karamazov and, and Dostoevsky in general. Um, I'm not an expert in Dostoevsky, but you know, I've read a heck of a lot of him. And so, and I also just want to like draw excerpts from his work and just share it with you because it's so beautiful. So again, this will be coming up over the next seven weeks for my patrons. So um, please, if you're a patron, Look out for that, would you? Because I don't want to be doing these videos. I'm literally drink. I have, anyway, I'll tell you that another day. Okay, second thing I want to tell you. Are you ready for this? Do you remember a couple of weeks ago? No, maybe a month ago, two months ago. Um, do you remember how I told you to tweet at Dave Rubin? Do you want an update? Okay, we just got this from Dave Rubin's assistant. She said, ba -ba -ba -ba, I received this email from person's name, and want to follow up with you. Dave is still officially off the grid, but I was able to speak with him yesterday about your requests. We are currently booked up with the Ruben Report, but Matt Frad is on our radar, and we will keep our eyes open for an opportunity when we might be able to make this work. We appreciate your enthusiasm and support. So that's the latest. So that sounds promising, although I have to say, it's a, it's a pretty... <laughs> as far as me getting on the Ruben report, it's not the best that for the last, you know, three episodes I've been talking about the problem of homosexuality in the priesthood when Dave is clearly a homosexual dude. <laughs> but Dave Ruben is also a super open-minded dude, so who knows? But anyway, I just want to let you know about that. If you want to tweet at him again to remind him to have Matt Fred on his show, feel free to do that because it looks like we're getting close. All right. Um, today's episode is fantastic, so... Get ready, okay? Here we go. Welcome to Pints with Aquinas. My name's Matt Frad. If you could sit down over a pint of beer with Thomas Aquinas and ask him any one question, what would it be? Today, we're going to ask Thomas to explain his fourth proof for the existence of God, the argument for God's existence from degrees of being. And joined around the bar table with us is my good mate and fellow Catholic apologist, Carlo Broussard. Here we go. <laughs> All right, welcome back to Pints with Aquinas. This is the show where you and I pull up a bar stool next to the angelic doctor to discuss theology and philosophy. This was a fantastic episode. I just got done doing it with Carlo, who's an awesome dude, by the way. Seriously, like no, not only is he massively intelligent, he's one of the most joyful and humble men uh, that I've ever had the joy of, of, of meeting, seriously. Um, he's got a new book out called Prepare the Way with Catholic Answers Press. We're going to be talking about that a little bit towards the end of today's episode, so stick around for that. But I want to let you know that we're going to be giving away three copies of this book for free. Doesn't matter where you are, doesn't matter where you live, we will post a copy to your door. And again, there's going to be three winners in total. How do you get in the raffle to win, you might ask? Well, here's how. All you have to do is share this episode on your social media, on Twitter specifically. So just take the URL from pintswithaquinas.com and or Libsyn, don't matter where, just to promote this 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 episode, iTunes, I don't care, okay? And post it to your Twitter account. Tell so tell people to listen to it. And the way we'll know that you've done it is I want you to use the hashtag Pints with Aquinas. Okay, we're going to go through, we're going to select three of you, and uh, we'll, those three winners will get a free book. And if you didn't win, you still got to tell people about this amazing podcast. So, hey, that's a good thing, too. All right, here's the show. Enjoy. Hey, Matt, thanks for having me, brother. How come we've done like a hundred and something episodes and you haven't been on yet? 
I have no idea, brother. That's yeah. a question that only you can answer, my friend. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you're finally on because it, I, I feel glad. I feel like you were really into Thomas Aquinas before, well, definitely before I was and definitely before other Catholic apologists were. So while Catholic apologists were like parroting William Lane Craig, not that there's anything wrong with that, <laughs> you're right? No, nothing wrong with that. He's amazing. Nothing uh, wrong with that. You either. were digging deep into Aquinas and his, his five ways. Well, I, I was. I was doing what I could. I, I must say, Matt, that I am a bit of an amateur when it comes to Aquinas. I've only been studying him for a few years now. When I started working with Father Robert Spitzer and the Magis Center is when I started getting into Aquinas. And of course, like many others, I was introduced to Aquinas in a more in-depth way uh, through the writings of Dr. Ed Fazer. So he was very instrumental in getting me to begin reading Aquinas more and more and trying to study his thought and his philosophy. And so that's when the flame really lit, when I started working with Father Spitzer, introduced to Aquinas, but also primarily through the writings of Dr. Fazer. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I I love studying Aquinas, and in particular, I love studying uh, his natural theology, his philosophical theology. It's a lot of fun. And so hopefully uh, we can geek out a little yeah, bit yeah. in this episode. Well, I, I, <laughs> I, some of that. I really appreciate your humility. I'm, I don't think there's anyone who knows what they're talking about who's, who says they're an expert in Aquinas. That would just be an imprudent <laughs> thing to say, you know? Amen to that, brother. Yeah, yeah. He's like Mount Everest. It's like, how do I come at him? And like, it's... Uh, oh, man. I'll tell you what, so in my clearly. research... And my research on the five ways, one thing that I concluded and realized is that, man, it's extremely difficult to come to a definitive conclusion on exactly what he's saying. There's so many various ways that you can approach his text. But what's interesting, Matt, is that no matter how you approach his text, and, you know, in his five ways in particular, you know, you may come at it with one angle, come at it at another angle, and even if it's not exactly what he's saying, you still have alternative metaphysical demonstrations for yeah. God's existence. You well, know, so you right. have a plethora of ways to demonstrate God's existence. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to chat with you about the fourth way today. Um, as our listeners know, these are summaries that right. Aquinas talks about elsewhere, and, uh, you know, these weren't necessarily original to Aquinas either, were they? Correct. No, no. He's drawn from uh, various different aspects of the five ways are coming from different philosophers, of course, primarily from Aristotle. Uh, Many of the aspects of the five ways he's drawn from Aristotle, some from others as well. Avicenna, as you know, Matt, and um, other philosophers that preceded him. So they're not totally original. There are some original aspects to it, I think, Mm -hmm. when you analyze the five ways and how he's making conclusions, putting things together. Uh, But the pieces that he's using, he's drawing from philosophers that preceded him. Now, I asked you to come on here so we could discuss the fourth way. Just like, uh, first of all, what do you think of the fourth way? (laughs) <laughs> like, as, as far as like, would this be the your go-to one? Is this one of your favorite, one of your least favorite? Do you think it has significant problems? Yeah. Do you well, like it? Well, here's here's the thing, Matt. When I think of the fourth way and and simply follow the principles embedded in the fourth way and reason through them, it's one of my favorites. Wow. Because it, it, it brings out certain metaphysical principles that I think can be reduced to first- principles of metaphysics, which provides a a metaphysical demonstration. And I think all the five ways can do that. But the fourth way is 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 unique and and very interesting. Now, I do I will admit, Matt, that I find it a bit difficult to try to match up what I have going on or what I think is going on in my mind exactly with his text. So there's yeah. there's various different options on how to take them. So for example, if you divide the the argument up into two parts, you know, the more and the less Could, presupposes mind, the mech- I don't mean to cut you off, but would you mind if I just yeah, quickly no read it for our listeners who might not be yes, even yes, aware of what we're do doing? Yes, yes, please do. And yeah. then yeah, we can take off from there. Okay, sounds good. He says the fourth way is taken from the gradation to be found in things. Among beings, there are some more and some less good, true, noble, and the like. But 
more and less are predicated of different things, according as they resemble in their different ways something which is the maximum. As a thing is said to be hotter, according as it more nearly resembles that which is hottest. So that there is something which is truest, something best, something noblest, and consequently, something which is uttermost being. For those things that are greatest in truth are greatest in being, as it's written in the metaphysics. Now, the maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus, as fire, which is the maximum heat, is the cause of all hot things. Therefore, there must also be something which is to all beings the cause of their being, goodness, and every other perfection, and this we call God. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. All right, cool. Now, as you mentioned, it's a definitely a summary. So what's difficult about all of the five ways, but the fourth way in particular, is certain metaphysical principles that are operating in the background. So I think the first thing to say, Matt, is to try and articulate what in the world is he starting off with, right? What is his datum that he's trying to explain? So as you read, you'll notice Aquinas is starting off with, we make comparative judgments yeah. about things being more or less good, true, and noble, right? And as, you know, anybody who studies the fourth way will come to find out what Aquinas is dealing with is what we call in philosophy the transcendentals, right? Now that's a, you know, a sort of a highfalutin philosophical term alert, right? So what are the transcendentals? And that basically refers to those attributes of being in as much as something is a being, right? So anything is in as much as something exists, mm -hmm. it's going to be good in some way. It's going to be true in some way. We can speak of it as being noble. Uh, these are properties of being, right? Qua being insofar as something is a being. Mm -hmm. So for example, true, true, it, the truth and philosophy, we would distinguish between logical truth and ontological truth, but truth as a transcendental is being as known by an intellect. So, so it's intrinsically related to being. So in as much as something exists, Matt, right? It has being, it has actuality. It's intelligible in some way. There is something there in the outside world that's real mm -hmm. that I can come to know given the fact that I'm an intellectual being, right? I have an intellect. I can know what is there. So, Matt, you are talking to me in this podcast, right? Mm -hmm. Or actually right now you're listening to me. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and so when I make the judgment, you are listening to me, that is a true judgment. My intellectual judgment corresponds to what is, what is really real, what is actual, right? Mm -hmm. And so in as much as something is actual or being, there's intelligibility there. There's something to be known by the intellect. And this is what philosophers mean when they say that something is... In as much as it is a being or has being, it is true because there is intelligibility to be known by the intellect. Now, so some things – Let's just go pa ahead. pause there for a moment because yeah. some things are higher up on the chain of being. So a man right. is higher than, than plant. But, but that, right. So do you want to say that plant has less being than man? Is that what yes, you're getting I, to? I, I do want to say that. There's yes. nothing that has no being because obviously something has no That's being. Nothing. It's nothing. So when you say right. – Something has to be intelligible. Um, I guess there's there's more to know. Something can be more intelligible if, if it has That's more right, existence. That's right, because okay. because you know the gardener Matt has more perfections, more things to be known about him, given his nature, than the plant that he's gardening with right. or in the flower bed, right? So we, in philosophy, we would speak of that as a virtual or transcendental quantity. So we're not talking about being being like you know physical quantity, like I have uh, more weight than somebody else or mm -hmm. more height than somebody else. But there is a transcendental quantity that can be spoken of when we're talking in the order of being, precisely because the flower, it is a being, it's distinct from nothing, mm -hmm. but given its nature, it has certain operations, certain activities, certain powers, right? Uh, but the gardener, in as much as he is a being distinct from nothing, given his nature as a human being, he has more powers, more right. activities, higher activities, such as rationality and volition, etc. Just, or, as, uh, just as the flower has more power and activities than the stone beside it, say. That, amen to that. So in as much as the gardener has more 
are higher powers, more and higher powers, it is more, the gardener is more perfect. There's more actuality. There's more being there. Gotcha. And so consequently, there's more stuff to know about the gardener than yeah. the flower. Thanks be to God, right? Yeah. There's more, like my, my wife is tilling the flower bed. There's more to be known about my wife right. than there is the flower. So this is what Aquinas is getting at when he says there are some things more or less true. Now, the same line of reasoning, although a bit different, applies to the good. There are some things more or less good. So let's look at my wife once again, the gardener. And is there a female version of the gardener? Gardener. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so let's take my wife and the flower again. We can we make this comparative judgment just intuitively. We do this. We'd say, yeah, my wife is better. Better than right. the flower. And I just want to pause here a moment because obviously, yeah. like we live in a society where people praise equality and condemn inequality, and so this idea that yeah. some things can be better than other things might be a difficult pill to swallow. But it's important to realize that even those people who say no, everything's equal, will say that you know human beings who are kind and tolerant are better than those there who are close-minded and oppressive. And so Amen. And yeah. that's a more that's a comparative judgment within uh, a given kind of thing. So you got one human compared to another human and judging those two humans insofar as they're being moral agents. So one's a better moral agent than the other, right? Mm -hmm. But and, but not only do we make comparative judgments with regard to the same kinds of things right. concerning a good person versus a not so good person or the good flower versus the not so good flower. Right. And that's actually the case in our flower bit. One flower is <laughs> right. like dying yeah. <laughs> and the other flower is flourishing, right? right? But we also make comparative judgments with regard to good and bad or better or worse uh, cross kinds, right? Yes. Cross categories. Yes. So like my wife is better than the flower. She is more good to sort of use the technical jargon there. Uh, more, there's more goodness to my wife than the flower. Why? Because there is more being, right? right? My wife is more noble than the flower more because she's yep. higher up in the hierarchy of being. Right. More interior modes of agency. Amen. Less yeah. dependency. That's right. Mm -hmm. So the activities are more uh, imminent within the being itself, less dependent upon things outside of itself. You know, the flower has no interior activity going on. You're it's right. entirely dependent upon external things. Or my, as my wife, she's dependent upon some external things, but not entirely like the flower. So she has imminent in, um Activities such as intellect and will and these powers is what are what mark her ranking higher up in the hierarchy of being. Mm -hmm. So this is what Aquinas means when he says there are some things more or less good. And you know, Matt, I wrote an article quite some time ago whenever the uh, incident with Harambe uh, mm, came out yeah. with the uh, silverback gorilla. You know, I remember coming across a particular uh, atheist. He, I can't remember his name. His name is sure. kind of difficult to pronounce, but he was the editor of Friendly Atheist. Oh, and yeah. His name is slipping I know who my you're mind right now. Yeah. yeah. And he acknowledged, you know, we're sad that we had to, you know, take the life of Harambe and put him down, but he was glad. He admitted of being glad that we saved the boy's life, the little boy who fell into the enclosure. Right. Hemet, Hemet so, Meta. That's there you go. Hammond Meadow. There yeah. you go. Okay. So he, so was, he yeah. recognized that the boy's life was better than the silverback gorilla. Did right? he say as much? Yeah, in the, in the blog, he, he well, he didn't say it in as much, but he recognized that it was, let's see, I, I, I can't find matter. the quote right now. Yeah, yeah. But he was recognizing that the boy's life was it was better that we save the boy's life than save the silverback gorilla's life. Yeah. Now, I would assume implied within that judgment, he recognizes that the boy's life has more value than the silverback gorilla's life. So even in that case, we, we intuitively recognize that some things are more good, to use the technical jargon than, to put it in proper English, better than other things, right? And this is what Aquinas is getting at. So the good, my, the bottom line here, 
is talking about the good as a transcendental is that it's being, right? Mm-hmm, you have, mm-hmm. we're talking, it, it, it's all reduced back to being. We're talking about being as desired, and that's what the good is, philosophically speaking. So the truth is being as known by an intellect, and the good is being as desired right. by a rational being with will, right? Of being able to desire being. So that being could so be... We, cons- that being could be considered as the, there's more being to be desired by the thing itself in regard to its desiring its own self-perfection, or there's more being to be desired by another rational creature, such uh-huh. as me. <laughs> I mean, there's more being to my wife to be desired by me than there is in the flower. Thus, my wife is more good or better than, more desirable than the flower or the plant. Excellent. Yep. So that's the datum that we're trying to explain. And what Aquinas wants to say, and as we'll get through it here in the in this session here, what Aquinas wants to say is he wants to try and articulate an ultimate explanation for why we make these judgments of more or less good, things being more or less true, more or less in being, and reason from that starting point. And he wants to argue that that datum, that gradation of being and consequently goodness and truth necessarily, metaphysically speaking, not probabilistically, but metaphysically necessitates a being that is simply subsistent being itself, subsistent goodness itself, subsistent truth itself. In other words, God. And of course, that requires a lot of legwork, which right. hopefully we'll get to some of that here. Now, <laughs> right, right away, I'm thinking of Dawkins' objection where he says, you know, by, by that logic, you should say, well, because, you know, there exists socks that smell or something like that, that there must <laughs> right. exist some out, some, some, somewhere out there a sock that smells the most. Or, right. you know, why do I have to take in a, a, a most smelly thing, a most hot thing? Or like, for example, I, I can agree that you or I uh, are taller than something else without having right. to concede that there exists an infinitely tall man. Yeah, and you know, this is uh, some, I mean, I can understand the objection, but it the objection indicates various flawed understandings of what Aquinas is getting at here. So, for, for example, Matt, you know, you bring up the example of the tall, you know, uh, you're taller than I am. And that's a fact because I'm a short dude okay. <laughs> and you are taller than I am. And as you mentioned, it would seem that that would necessarily presuppose an infinitely tall man. Well, if you make that analogy, if you make that parallel, that indicates you're misunderstanding what mm. Aquinas is getting at with, first of all, uh, you can't have an inf- actually infinite tall person because what you're saying is that there's you're ascribing actual infinity to quantity and that's a metaphysical impossibility as Aquinas would argue you can't have something pertaining to quantity and matter that is that then which there is nothing greater so when we're talking about height which has to do with quantity which has uh-huh. to do with matter it is impossible to even have an infinity of height but isn't see? isn't isn't Aquinas using a qualitative way and talking about hot, what's hotter than something else? That's right. But I would I would argue that when Aquinas is using... Now, first of all, he, you know, of, of, of ascribing the hottest within fire, right. that, you know, he's, he's mistaken in that. But I it, like this, by the way. I just want a little side note there. It's not like we have to agree with all of his little analogies. That's right, because right. Some, of, some of the things that he's using from his empirical observation, given contemporary science, we know are flawed. Right. But so that'll be, the, that'll be the, I can imagine that'd be the first thing that someone would bring up. You, you lay the fourth right. way out and they're like, this guy's a bloody dunderhead. He thinks that fire <laughs> is the hottest, you know. So it's right, important right. we don't have to get, we, we, can, we can concede. Okay, granted, like this illustration that he uses isn't great, but the principle behind it, yeah. Yeah, and and so so that would be the first way I would respond to that analogy, and with regard to smelliness, even the smelliness would be the same thing, in the, in the sense that odor is one of the you know what we would smell would be one would fit within one of the nine categories of accidents of Aristotle's right. accidents right so you got substance that's one category then the nine categories of accidents and so smelliness is intrinsically involved within you know the idea of odor that's right. necessarily restricted to matter you right. can't get beyond the boundaries of matter with regard to smell so consequently you could never arrive at some sort of subsistent smelliness 
itself, as Dawkins seems to want right. to conclude. So that indicates that you're not uh, the, the the objection doesn't even get off on the right foot. So there's a distinction as, here that needs to be like between substantial being and accidental being. Is that kind of what you're saying? Like it doesn't work with right. accidental being. That's right, because the datum of the fourth way, Matt, is the transcendentals, which means they are being, and then, of course, its attributes of goodness and truth, are not restricted to any category of being such right. as such as the the nine categories of accidents there is in its formal in the formal concepts of being goodness and true there is nothing of imperfection within the concepts concerning their formality so they're not restricted in any way to any of the accidental categories of being in fact they transcend all categories of being and all individuals, you see? That's why they're called the transcendental. Mm-hmm. So in as, in as much as anything, whether a substance or an accident has being, well, then there's being, there's goodness, there's truth. And so precisely because of this unique characteristic of being and its attributes of goodness and truth, transcending all categories of being and all individuals, then you actually have the possibility, at least the possibility of there existing a, a reality that is subsistent being, subsistent goodness, subsistent truth itself, because it would be transcending all the accidental categories, all individuals. So because of its transcendental character, there's at least the possibility of having an infinite maximum of being truth and goodness. Whereas the examples of smelliness and height, that's simply not possible because those qualities, that that quantity of height and the quality of odor necessarily is restricted to those accidental categories of being, and thus you can't transcend, you can't get beyond. Now, concerning Aquinas' principle of more and less sort of a uh, resembling a maximum mm-hmm. or a, approximating a maximum, this would be another way in which I would begin to respond to that objection is that I don't know if Thomas at that point in the argument is necessarily arguing that our comparative judgments of more or less for anything necessarily presupposes an absolute infinite maximum like he would be thinking for the transcendentals, right? right? He, it's very, I think what he's getting at is he's just using this principle of approaching a relative maximum. So if we take height, right? Mm -hmm. So you are taller than I am, and it doesn't necessarily presuppose infinite height. It just presupposes that you, I, I am less tall than you approaching this relative maximum. Whether there is a, 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 a person uh, who is maximum in height that we don't know of anybody else, right? right? We don't know of what that maximum height is of any human being that's the tallest in the world, right? Or maybe we do. But the judgment of height is simply as we approach a relative maximum. And as I said earlier, you can't have, you know, a person uh, that that which there is nothing greater concerning height because in actual infinity and height are mutually exclusive from one another. So I think what Aquinas is getting at when he's talking about more or less approaching a maximum, and, yeah. I, and I think Phaser's right on here in his uh, work, Aquinas, when Dr. Phaser deals with the fourth way. I think what, Aqu- what Aquinas wants us to get our intellect, um, wants to, wants, sort, of, sort of wants to get the juices flowing, right? And that is this, consider the fact that we judge one triangle to be better than, the, than another triangle. Mm-hmm. Right. So the triangle drawn on the stationary on the paper on a desk with, you know, a pencil and, you know, the, the, the tools that we need to draw straight lines. Mm-hmm. And then you draw a triangle on the back seat of the bus as the bus is bouncing up and down with, a, you know, with a pen or something. The triangle that you draw on the seat on the bus seat is going to be less good than the triangle that you draw on the desk with a piece of paper and a pencil and the tools that you need. Why? Because the, pa- the, the triangle that you draw on the stationary desk is going to approach triangularity 
better than, it's going to instantiate the universe or the nature of triangularity better than the triangle on the bus seat. So notice how whenever we judge these two triangles, one to be better than the other, we're judging it based upon the standard of what a triangle is. One approximates and approaches the what a triangle right. is in its full sense better than another. So, could, just, so you just, just go just, ahead. Just very, um, I guess, just to sum it up, then Aquinas is talking about being, and so and and these things like your wife and the flower and the rock by the flower are good in as much as they approach being itself? That's right, and that was my next step. So when we compare two triangles, we're comparing them insofar as they are triangles. When I compare uh, one plant to another plant, one better okay. than the other, this is I good. compare them insofar as they are plant. Right. When I compare wife, gardener, to plant, I compare them insofar as they are plant beings. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So notice that the standard by which I am judging them or, or comparing them is being itself. Right. Right? Yep. And so just as you compare a triangle insofar as what is fully a triangle or plants insofar as what is what it means fully to be a plant, when we're comparing beings insofar as they're beings, we're comparing them insofar as they are fully what it means to be a being, right? Yep. So we go from more restricted to less restricted. Now, as the intellect makes this comparative judgment, right off the bat, we can see that it's at least reasonable that as you ascend the hierarchy of being of less good to more good, right? Plant to gardener, my wife, it's at least reasonable that there would be a being that's totally unrestricted. So the plant's more restricted than my wife, right? My wife is less restricted than the plant, given her mode of being, her way of acting, her way of behaving, her way of being, right? So it's at least reasonable that as we ascend the hierarchy of being, the intellect eventually comes to a reality that's absolutely unrestricted in being. Right. And not restricted in any way to this mode of being or that mode of being. To Which being is, a plant, to being a gorilla, or to being a human, but a reality that would be being itself, where its essence would be to be, subsistence amazing. being itself. Which yeah. is why Aquinas is so insistent on us not being able to know what God is, since we can't define <laughs> God, right? That's right. We can only chop away this sort of neg via negativa, right, of chopping away at these restrictions, right? Uh, restricted in the plant sense, restricted mode of being in the animal sense, restricted mode of being in a body-soul composite, namely a rational animal sense, and restricted being in the sense of an angel whose essence and existence are not identical, but conjoined together, right? And then eventually arriving at this reality where uh, we have a reality that is absolutely simple, where there is no distinction of essence and existence, but they are identical. And so at this point in the argument where Aquinas is at, where he's saying, so there must, so there is something that is truest, noblest, best, and consequently uttermost being itself, right? And so here's here's where the dilemma is. I'll be honest with you. I, I'm not quite sure exactly. I have two avenues that we could take here, and this might muddy the waters a little bit too much. Sure. But one avenue to take is there's a there's a way by which we can arrive at uttermost being, metaphysically speaking, as demonstrable from the starting point of these gradations of being that we've been considering so far, right? And so the question is, is Aquinas doing that at the end of the first part of the fourth way, where he says, so there is a being, there is something that is truest, noblest, best, and consequently uttermost being? Or is Aquinas right there simply arriving at the conclusion of a maximum being in a dialectical way, like probabilistically, where the intellect just sort of assents to it, and then demonstrates it metaphysically in the second part, where he says, where the maximum of any genus is the cause of everything in the genus. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you to help us understand. Yeah. Let's, so, let's read it. The maximum in any genus is the cause of all in that genus. Help us understand right. that, could you? 
Yeah, well, here's here we have to back up a little bit. Okay, so sure. first of all, we have if if we acknowledge that this probabilistic ascendancy, right, to, you know, less restricted, less restricted, less restricted, while I get to my intellect sort of sees intuitively that it's possible there's this reality that is totally unrestricted, right? So it probably exists. But how do I know that such an uttermost being metaphysically exists? Mm -hmm. And I think this is where we have to come and we employ certain metaphysical principles. So for example, Matt, and this is just a summary of it, which would require a little bit more explanation, but let's see how I can do here. Inasmuch as we make these comparative judgments of the wi- of my wife being more good than the flower, more true than the flower, more noble than the flower, I, I acknowledge that the flower is limited in its being, right? Inasmuch as something can be a, a predicated of something as more or less, I know that thing is limited in its being. Like the flower, the flower doesn't exhaust the fullness of being because there's other beings that are higher than it, right? Mm-hmm. Harambe didn't or didn't exhaust the fullness of goodness. Why? Because there are beings that are higher in goodness, mm-hmm. namely the boy's life that was saved. Yeah. So inasmuch as things can be graded in their being, I know that they're limited in their mode of being, existing in this way, not in some other way, right? Now, here's something interesting, Matt. Whenever we philosophically analyze beings that are limited in their mode of being, in philosophy, we say that they have their being per accidents. Mm. That is to say, their act of being, which distinguishes them from nothing, is not essential. It's not identical to their nature but it's extrinsic. So any being that's limited in its mode of being, that act of being for that thing is distinct from its nature. All right, let's just pause essence. there a moment. because yes. That's a very profound statement, and I want to just Amen. run at it at a different angle, if you could, okay. for those who've just missed that, but are feeling like they're hanging on by their fingernails. Okay. Yep. All right, so, so, so being that is limited, you're saying, must, be, yes. must participate That's right. Its essence must be different from its existence. Why is that the case? And here's the reason why. Many philosophers, there's a certain principle uh, within Thomistic philosophy that states that, okay, if being were essential to that thing, like if if the flower had being per se, Mm -hmm. by its very nature, by its very essence, and its nature was to be, well, then there would be no reason why its being is limited. Right. For if if it were to have it by nature, it would have it unlimited. Like, for example, no sense can be made in saying that a triangle has three straight sides, more or less, like triangularity itself. The essence of a triangle is to have three straight sides, not more or less. If it's less than three straight sides, it's not a triangle, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So something that whenever we're talking about the essence of something, you, a thing can't have that which it has by its nature, more or less, it either has it or doesn't. So for example, you, Matt, (laughs) you're a rational being, man. You're either a rational animal or you're not. It's not like you have more rationality or less rationality. Why? Because rationality belongs to your essence. That's what it means for you to be a human being, Right. right? So if the flower had being by nature, and its nature was identical to its act of being, and it had it per se, well, then there would be no reason why it would be limited. It would, ex- If it had it by nature, it would have it in an unlimited way. It would exhaust being itself, right? right, right. And there, there, there could be, it could not be graded relative to my wife, the gardener. Excellent. So because of that, I know... That that flower, and this is just one of the many ways that I know that the flower's act of being is distinct from its nature, but I think this is the portal that Aquinas is walking through in order to see how these things that are graded in being have being per accidents rather than per se. That is to say, their act of being is not identical to their nature. So there's a composition, there's a metaphysical composition in that graded being there, in that flower, where its nature, essence, is distinct from its being or existence. And if that is the case, 
Well, here's the beautiful part of it, Matt. And right. this, was where, this is where I just start getting like a oh, kid in a candy I shop, feel man. You. I'm here. I, I'm feeling the same way. And whenever I, whenever I come to that point where there is a distinction, a metaphysical distinction of essence and existence or nature and the act of being, then that necessarily requires a cause outside of itself. Right. And we could talk about that some more if you would like, uh, but ultimately... It's going to require a cause, and I and the reason why it requires a cause, it requires a cause based upon. I think we can reduce that argument to first principles because if there is no cause, then there would be no reason for why there is a conjoining of the essence and existence rather than not, and so you're violating the fundamental principle of reason, the principle of sufficient reason. That's and excellent. If there, yeah, because if there's nothing, so we have this this thing, right? It's a metaphysical composition, essence and existence are conjoined, okay? And you say, well, there is no cause. It's just a brute fact that these two metaphysical components are conjoined. So what you're saying is that there is nothing to distinguish no unity of essence and existence from unity of essence and existence, but if there is nothing to distinguish no unity from unity, well, then you have no unity. Because where there is no difference, there is identity. Right. So you fundamentally are reduced to a first principle of reason and demanding that this conjoining of two distinct metaphysical principles of nature, act of being, essence, and existence necessarily requires a cause outside of itself. And then, of course, we're off to the races. If that cause is just like the flower where its nature and act of being are distinct and conjoined, it's going to need a cause in as much as it's causing the flower to to be, right? And then since we can't have an infinite regress that's ordered in an essential way, and I'm, I know I'm presupposing a lot of stuff here, but because we can't have an essentially ordered series of caused causes without a cause that mm-hmm. is not mm-hmm. caused, we come to a cause whose essence is not distinct from its existence, but a cause whose essence is identical to its existence or its nature is identical to its active being. And that, Matt, is the maximum being, the being that is unrestricted, unlimited, absolutely speaking, that than which there can be nothing greater. Right. That and, maximum being. And this everyone understands to be God. That, amen. (laughs) And it is that maximum being that so far right now, all I've said is that maximum being is, yes, we can say God, but that maximum being is what explains why that flower right here and right now has the act of being distinguishing it from nothing, right? Of conjoining the nature and the act of being, the essence and existence. Now, here's something interesting. I think what Aquinas, it's some scholars will say, whenever you go through that line of reasoning that I just went through, Mm -hmm. that's what Aquinas is saying in the second part. The maximum of of a genus is the cause of all in that genus, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore, the maximum of being, the maximum being is the cause of all in the genus of being, and genus being used in the common sense there, just in as much as everything has being. But here's something I'm wondering, Matt. I actually came across this this morning when I was thinking about it, to be honest with you. Sure. I wonder, I wonder that at the end of the first part, Thomas metaphysically concludes this maximum being that we just reasoned to, starting from the graded being of the flower, right? And then in the second part, what Thomas wants to say is that that maximum being that's the cause right here and right now of the being of that flower is also the cause of all beings. Right. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So, so not only, not only the cause of, the, you know, the maximum being not being only the cause of that graded being, namely the flower, but also the cause of all things under the umbrella 
of being, hmm. except for except of course for itself, uh, for itself because it cannot be caused. It's subsistent being itself. So, in as much as something has being. And of course, having being is distinct from being being, if that makes sense to your listeners. And I think they, <laughs> if they study Thomas, they'll know that. But in as much as something has being, participates in being, like that flower, well then that something is going to have this maximum being, the, that is subsistent being itself, the cause of its being. And so possibly what Aquinas is getting at in that second part of the proof is simply to say that the maximum being that we know must exist metaphysically speaking, that we arrived at through the reasoning that I employed earlier, that being is not only the cause of just that one graded being, the flower that I started with, it's the cause of all things that have being. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. things that who, for which being is distinct from its nature, or its act of existence is distinct from its essence. You just started thinking and about that part this morning, or? That just popped this morning, brother. Yeah. <laughs> because I was trying to, I, I'll be honest with you, I was trying to figure out exactly uh, where that metaphysical demonstration fits. Because notice earlier I talked about how ascending up the hierarchy of being mm -hmm. seems to be dialectical or probabilistic, right? Yep. And then saying, well, yeah, there's you know, more or less approaching the maximum, more or less being, so we're going to get to this maximum being and unrestricted. And that's, that's dialectical. That's not necessarily a metaphysical demonstration. And if somebody, if, if Thomas out there can show me how that's a metaphys metaphysical demonstration, I'll be more than happy to accept it. But so far in my intellectual journey, it seems dialectical to me. And so, but, but obviously, I mean, Quine, Aquinas is all about metaphysical demonstration demonstrations, right? And reducing things to first principles. So the metaphysical demonstration that I employed earlier, that is to say, if something is limited, then it has being per accidens. If per accidens, then a cause can't have the infinite regress and essentially ordered series of cause causes, therefore subsistent being itself. And, 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 and I know that's what Aquinas, that's what's, it seems that's what's working in the background. And so if that's where Aquinas is at at the end of the first part of the fourth way, then we have a metaphysical demonstration that subsistent being itself exists. That's a reality. And then in the second part, simply wanting to say, well, that subsistent being is not only the cause of that one particular graded being we started with, but all right. things that have being. You see? Wonderful. So, yeah, it's, it's possibly either way. You know, he, he could be employing the metaphysical demonstration in the second part, and so like some scholars, some scholars will say that the first part's dialectical and the second part is metaphysical. You know, some will say that the first part is trying to arrive at the maximum being implicitly, and then in the second part, employing this metaphysical demonstration to make it explicit. And so I'm simply thinking that maybe perhaps the metaphysical demonstration is in the first part, just working in the background, arriving at something that is maximum being itself, and then in the second part, simply saying that maximum being is the cause not only of just this one thing, but all things all right. outside of itself. So that, that's fan that's fascinating. That's really great. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I, I want to do two things uh, now. The first thing might seem a little unfair. I'm going to spring it on you. Suppose <laughs> suppose somebody is listening to this podcast and their kid just walked into the room and their kid is like 13, 14 years old. Okay. I, want, I want to ask you to sum up Aquinas' way and just, just in, a, in a brief way, I, I, of course, it's going to be you know, insufficient because you're going to have to say sure. it so briefly. But how would sure. you basically argue the fourth way for God's existence to say a 14-year-old skeptic? Well, I, you see, I think... Matt, this is where sort of the dialectical approach can come in, you see? Yep. Because remember, when we're arguing for God's existence, in the, in the inquiry into God's existence, it's not necessary that we always employ metaphysical demonstrations, although that's the best way, right? But I think probabilistic arguments is a rational approach as sure. well. Yeah. So, so I would start with the dialectical approach and say, hey, look, is mom better than the flower? Yes. Okay, well, why do you think mom is better than the flower? 
Okay, well, let's think this through. Can the flower move like mom? No. Can the flower think like mom? No. So mom has these powers different than the flower that are better, wouldn't you think? Don't you think it's better to be a human than a flower? And I must say, Matt, you point this out beautifully in your book, uh, Does God Exist? The Socratic Dialogue. And so the 14-year-old says, yeah, I guess so. You know, mom's better than the flower and it's better to be a human than the flower, okay? And then I would try to explain to him, well, notice how the flower is like more confined, right? Can do less things than mom. Mom can do more things. Mom's not as confined as the flower. She can move all over the place. She can think about anything she wants. The flower can't do that stuff. Now, 14-year-old son, well, actually, my son, Dominic, he's going to be 14 in a month here, so I can talk to Dominic. <laughs> so, Dominic, if if you can go from, you know, less, uh, more limited to less limited, more confined to less confined. So, you got the flower, it's confined, it's limited. You kind of go up, mom's less confined, less limited, less restricted in its power, right? Well, don't you think it's at least reasonable that there would be a being that's not confined at all, not limited at all, not restricted at all, but is like full power, right? right. And not limited to being in this place and, and not that place, not limited to thinking in this way and not that way, but a reality that would be totally unlimited in its powers and in its way of behaving and its way of being. Doesn't that seem reasonable to you? Yeah. I mean, just kind of going from more limited to less limited. I suppose even before we jump to up. completely unlimited, we could even ask the 14-year-old, theoretically, wouldn't it be possible that there's some alien life that's there you go. more, that's right. you know, less restricted than, than even you know, mum, you know? That's right. Yeah, I kind of skipped over. Yeah. I, I kind of skipped over the aliens oh, and then, yeah. there. But and then and then, but notice you can even go higher and 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 lead the fourteen year old even on the next step. So if we postulate the hypothetical possibility of alien life, who right. are superior in some way in intelligence, there you still have composition of yes. matter, matter and form, right? A spirit and matter, and so maybe even possibly a reality that doesn't have matter, but still is, but, right. but it doesn't have matter, but is spiritual, a spiritual intelligence, but maybe an intelligence that's still restricted and limited in some way, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then go even above that with a spiritual intelligence that's less limited, and then the intellect ascending to the possibility of a reality that is supremely unlimited, I absolutely love it. speaking, So we just in went from flowers to mum to extraterrestrial life to angels to archangels to God, you know, like, yeah, so, okay, yeah, theoretically, the 14-year-old says, okay, yeah, that's possible, doesn't mean that it right. is, then what do you say? Right, and then we have to employ the metaphysical demonstration to say, okay, all right, well, you see that flower right there, yeah, do you think it caused itself? <laughs> uh, no, I mean, and so I would ask my son, I would say, you know, why is it that the flower exists in that way? And why doesn't the flower exist in mom way? Now, you might kind of get a blank stare right there, right? Because that's not a, an a easy, I mean, we don't normally think about that. But I think it does get the ball rolling and saying, okay, well, that flower, it didn't have to exist that way. Mm -hmm. It could have existed in another way. And so we have to ask, why? Why does it exist at all, rather than not existing? I mean, obviously, it's not like a triangle. And I would say, you know, son, can there ever be a time when a triangle doesn't have three straight sides? Mm, no. Because, I mean, if you have a triangle that's not three straight sides, guess what? You ain't got a triangle. Well, was there ever a time when that flower didn't exist? Yeah, it didn't exist a month ago or whatever, you know? Is there going to be a time when the flower won't exist? Yeah, it's, it's about to die right there, right? It's withering away. And so I would ask my son, well, okay, so it doesn't, it, doesn't ha it doesn't exist in the way like a triangle has three straight sides, right? And so I would try to explain to him that that flower doesn't have to be. Right. It doesn't have to be in the way that it is. So in order to explain why it is rather than not, why it's this way rather than some other way, we're going to have to have some kind of cause, right? So it's got to it's cause 
it's got a reason for its being, for its existence outside of itself. I can't look to the flower and say, yep, the flower exists by its very own nature. It's going to need something outside of itself. And then I would walk my son step by step and trying to lead him to trying to realize, look, just as you can't have that lamp suspended in midair and explain that the lamp is exp- is is um, is suspended in midair because of an infinite number of chains, you know, of links in the chain without a being, right? Mm-hmm. Or you can't have an infinite number of interlinked train cars without an engine car. You can't have an infinite number of causes that are caused by something else without something that is not caused. Right. And that uncaused cause is God. So I would try that, to employ the image. Yeah, I would try to yeah. employ the image of the lamp of the interlinked train cars and say, "Hey, listen. You know, no car in that inter- in that chain of cars of train cars can give motion to any other car. Why? Because no car in the chain of series of cars has motion to give. You can. It has s- to. You can see. Sorry to cut you off. You can see why people fine. do rely on. Craig's arguments. They're far less complicated. <laughs> they don't involve this sort of Aristotelian yeah. metaphysical jargon. Like just yeah, to say yeah. something because it exists, has a cause, you know, it's going to exist, has a right. cause. Right, right. I mean, it's a smart, I think it's probably a smart thing if you don't have much time. Uh, would you Would you yeah, agree I mean, that Aquinas' I mean, ways aren't the ones to jump to right away? But I feel like I as I go through them, they feel more satisfying. Oh, yes, definitely. Because I would submit... And um, like, for example, the Kalam argument, right? Yeah. I have my I have my doubts. I used to think it was pretty solid, but I have the my philosophi- doubts. Of, the philosophical version. Yeah, the philo- even the philosophical yeah. version. Whether whether or not Gosh, we can man. have, whether or not the infinite past, whether or not uh, past time can be infinite. I used to be of the persuasion that it couldn't. I thought it was pretty solid. Now, do but you now have? I'm, do you have to? Res- I'm a little agnostic. Do you have to resort to the B theory in order to escape it, or can you can you agree with the A theory and still say it doesn't work? Uh, I think you can. I think you can still uh, go with the A theory and say it doesn't work. Uh, and interesting. I, I'm, I, yeah, I'm still working through it. But even if, let's just say, Matt, and here's here's how, here's I'm going to geek out a little bit and distinguish in between Aquinas's ways and the Kalam, for example. I think the Kalam is a persuasive argument, but I'm not quite sure it's as metaphysically sound as Aquinas's five ways. But let's just say, even if you can demonstrate the premise that their uh, past time cannot be infinite, mm-hmm. that there must be a finitude of past time. Okay. And you get to this creator, right? The problem you run into with that creator of the Kalam yeah. is that that creator is only a creator in theory, mm-hmm. but n- and that is to say a creator of becoming, right. but not necessarily a creator in essay. Mm-hmm. That is a crea- a sustaining creator right. of sustaining something existing here and now. Whereas so you've the got subsisting- the watchmaker god, maybe. That's yeah, right, right. That's right. Whereas in the five ways, and in particular for this episode, you know, yeah. the fourth way, the subsistent being, the right. maximum being that you arrive at in the conclusion, it's, it's not just. Now. Amen. Right. It's not just a creator in Fieri. He is the cause and the sustainer right. of that graded mode of being, namely the flower, right here right now, and right now, yeah, yeah. not just temporally in the past. So that's kind of like one of the uh, weaknesses that I would see in the Kalam argument in comparison to and, and, and Aquinas' five ways. And I think like because Craig doesn't believe in divine simplicity— that's uh, right. So when people say to him, "Well, ha- why is there only one God?" He has that very, he has that answer that doesn't feel very convincing. He just says, "Well, Occam's right. razor shaves away unnecessary beings." And you just say, and "You just need one." And you're like, "Ah, that doesn't feel very convincing." That's, and, and that's yeah. probabilistic. It's yeah. not a metaphysical demonstration, which can be reduced to first principles, right? right? Whereas when you're dealing with the uncaused cause of the second way, the unactualized actualizer of the first way, the absolutely necessary being in the third way, the subsistent maximum being in the fourth way, and the supreme maximum intelligence that's not directed by anything outside of itself in the fifth way, those causes that you arrive at, which of course is all the same cause, but you can you can analyze, conceptually analyze the reality of the uncaused cause and deduce from that absolute simplicity and from absolute simplicity, 
absolute uniqueness. Right. And I actually wrote about this recently. A couple of weeks ago, I posted an article at Catholic.com for our Catholic Answers magazine online, where I gave a philosophical argument of why there can only be one pure essay. Mm -hmm. So if I arrive at the subsistent being itself of the fourth way, and of course embedded within the conclusion of all the other uh, ways, we can deduce from that there that such an uncaused cause, such pure essay, there can only be one uniquely, absolutely unique. And you hit the nail on the head, Matt, because that absolute unicity follows from absolute simplicity. So if you take away absolute simplicity, well, then what are you left with? As you pointed out, some sort of probabilistic reasoning rather than a metaphysical demonstration. All right. Well, as we wrap up here, I want to just ask you three questions that have come in to us from our Patreon supporters. Now, these questions, I think you've addressed, but it doesn't okay. hurt to kind of just answer it quickly. You know, it's, it's like these, these are very complex topics. Sometimes having something said <laughs> more than once, you know, Amen can be very... That, brother. So if you're okay, let's just go through this. Tom Dixon, who's a, been a huge supporter of Pines of the Quines for a while. Tom, you're the greatest. Thank you. He says, this always seems, meaning the fourth way, quite tied to Plato's forms. The according as they resemble in their different you're ways right. something which is the maximum part is Amen. probably the most difficult to see. For example, four is... Uh, more than three, but that doesn't show that there's some maximum quantity. So I know you've addressed that, but you just want to say right. like less than a paragraph in response? <laughs> yeah, so very quickly with regard to Plato's forms, I think Phaser's right on the money in his treatment of the fourth way where he talks about how Aquinas is employing you know, the idea or the reasoning of Plato's forms in as much as you compare one triangle to another and you judge one triangle to be better than the other, it's based upon the standard of triangularity itself. It's based upon a standard that, you know, the fullness of what it means to be a triangle. I judge plant A better to, to be better than plant B in so far as what it is to be a plant, right? So there is, a, you know, Aquinas so to speak, is tipping his hat to Platonic forms and to Plato in order to simply use it as a tool to get the intellect beginning to reason on how we make these comparative judgments of more and less. But I think where he departs from Plato and he begins employing Aristotelian principles in metaphysics is that when we judge something to be more or less concerning being, goodness, and truth, we necessarily are analyzing these beings as being limited and thus participating in being. And what Aquinas is doing in the metaphysical demonstration that I articulated earlier is what he's saying is that anything that participates in being, anything that's limited in being and thus is contingent upon a cause outside of itself for its mode of being— ultimately reduces in a cause that is being itself, you see? Right. And so that's where Aquinas employs Aristotelian principles in order to bring out the metaphysical demonstration of arriving at ipsum esse subsistence. And then, of course, concerning the quantity thing, yeah. I think this questioner, this inquirer is right on the money that concerning quantity you cannot arrive at infinite quantity because right. that's a contradiction, right? You can't have an uh, actual infinity of quantity or any of the other uh, accidental Accidents. categories of being. Right. Excellent. That was a great answer. Thanks. Brian Damerick um, says, how does Aquinas, and again, you've answered this, but again, you might just want to give a brief response. How does Aquinas get those things which he bases God's perfection on, and why does he exclude others? In other words, why does he choose being, truth, and beauty mm. rather than evil, height, or smelliness as, right. the as these characteristics that must have a maximum that points to God? Also, how does he deduce that these maximum points to the same one thing rather than multiple okay. things. All right, this is a huge couple of questions, and we've yeah. we've I think you've addressed the first part very well. Right. The second part right. we touched upon a moment ago. But yeah, so just in brief, with regard to the first part, the reason he's starting with being goodness, truth, and nobility is because those things in their formal denotation, in their formal concepts, they have no imperfection whatsoever. Right? So when we're talking about 
quality or quantity, such as smelliness or height, those necessarily have involved within their formal connotation imperfections because these are accidental qualities that inhere in something else. So necessarily, they're imperfect because they're dependent upon the substance in which they inhere. So by virtue of their accidental essay, their accidental being, they're necessarily imperfect, right? And furthermore, they're restricted to, uh, with regard to quantity, is restricted to material being. So that's an imperfection. Right. When we talk about goodness, being, truth, nobility, and nobility is just kind of like goodness and being and all of them kind of put together. Uh, what we're talking about are attributes of being that are not restricted in any way. They don't connote any sort of imperfection, for in and of themselves they are perfect, and they're only imperfect in the flower because of the essence or the nature of the flower that restricts the being, yep. right, rather, uh, and rather than the imperfection being in being itself. So because these transcendentals have no imperfections embedded within them. They transcend all categories and all individuals, and consequently that is what Aquinas wants to say, hey, that's our starting point, and I'm going to tell you something. In as much as we have the gradations of these transcendentals in creatures, it's going to require the maximum of these perfections, namely God. Now, as to why uh, there's one being, that yeah. is maximum being, per goodness, truth, etc., well, remember... The answer fundamentally lies in the idea that these are transcendentals. Right. So truth is not different than being. Truth is being. It's just looking at being from a different aspect as known. So it's being as it relates to an intellect. That's what we call truth. When we're talking about the good, we're talking about being, but as it relates to a rational creature desiring the being, right? So these are transcendentals. So in as much as we come to ultimate unrestricted ipsum esse subsistence, the act of being itself, right? Well, then it's ultimate goodness because being and goodness are convertible. It's ultimate intelligibility, as Father Spitzer used to say, the complete set of <laughs> answers to the complete set of questions, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Pure, unrestricted act of understanding or intelligibility. Well, that's convertible with being, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is why we can say that the maximum in being, maximum in truth, maximum in goodness is one and the same being, which ultimately is the same being as he arrives at in the other ways of the five ways. Excellent. Okay, final question, and this is more of a pastoral question, so I think it'll be a nice note to end on. Okay, uh, beautiful. Kelly Brockett says, how do you approach this argument if you're talking to a relativist? Well, you can't. <laughs> I think fundamentally, <laughs> you can't, yeah. because you th the argument presupposes that there is some truth that we can come to know. Right. So you have to back up and get back to square one in order to demonstrate that there is truth that we can come to know. Whether or whether, what that truth is, that's the question that Aquinas is answering in the five ways, namely yeah. God, pure intelligibility. So, and, and of course, I would employ, you know, the method of showing the incoherence, the self-contradictory nature of the assertion that there is no absolute truth, that's self-referentially incoherent, right? Because then as much as you make the statement, you're assuming, you're making, you're making a truth claim. You're basically saying it's absolutely true that there is no absolute truth, which right. violates the fundamental principle of non-contradiction, right? And I think, so, too, like, as you say, this is, I think a lot of people give lip service to the idea of epistemological or moral relativism, but I used that analogy earlier on. Usually the person that says everything's equal, there is no truth, still thinks that the person who is fair and just is better. You know, it's difficult to get around right. this. Yeah, That's right. That's right. You, you, In fact, it's not only difficult, you cannot escape absolute truth because it because it's very, it belongs to the very nature of the mind the second act of the mind is the act of judgment and yeah. in as much as you make an act of judgment and you say something is you're making the claim that your judgment conforms to being and something in reality so the only way there could be no truth is if there were no being 
right. you see, yeah. and no intellect to know that being. And of course, if you deny all being, well, then you deny yourself who's making the assertion that there is no being. <laughs> that's wonderful. So that's, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's absolutely dude, thank incoherent. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today. And Matt, y- you're welcome, brother. Dude, you're, you're incredible. This is, this is fantastic. And I, I'm so thankful that you took the time to, to do this. I, I, I'm going to speak about this in the beginning of this episode in the introduction, but tell us a bit about your book for people who are listening okay. and why they should get it. Yeah, so my book is Prepare the Way, How to Overcome, uh, let's see, Prepare the Way, Overcoming Obstacles to God, the Gospel, and the Church. And so basically what I do is, it's the motif of John the Baptist, removing obstacles and preparing a way for the Lord, who's bearing the gifts of truth and life, particularly for unbelievers and skeptics. So I coach the reader, Matt, in strategies with Socratic questions on how to remove obstacles to truth, God, Jesus, Christianity, and church. So how can I believe in the truth when people believe so many different things? How can I believe in God when there's so much evil in the world? How can I believe in Jesus when I can't trust the historical reliability of the Gospels? And so that's what I do. 34 chapters, removing 34 obstacles uh, to these various topics. Yeah. And so again, people could go to shop.catholic.com and I'll put a link in the show notes and just type in prepare the way and you can get your excellent That's book. It. Congratulations, yeah. man. This is your first full Thanks, book, right? It is, man. And it certainly it doesn't look like a breeze. It's 360 pages. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty substantial, man. It's pretty substantial. You happy with how it all came out? I am. I'm very happy. I'm very grateful to the team here at Catholic Answers who, you know, collaborated with me in producing it, especially our editor, Todd Aglialoro. He is a, He's a champion master. Yeah, he man. really is. Amen. Yeah. yeah. So I'm I'm so stoked about it, very excited. And people people are loving it, man. They're you know, it's getting some good reviews. People who are interviewing me are loving it. And so I'm very grateful for it. And I'm I'm grateful to the Lord. Uh, for his grace and being able to accomplish it. And so, uh, yeah, man, just rocking and rolling. Awesome, and I must say, Matt, yeah. thank you so much for having me on, brother, because oh, it's an honor. it was a, quite a delight to geek out on Thomas with you, brother. <laughs> thank you. Oh, how's your brain feel? Did you feel your IQ going up as you were listening to Carlo? I think I did. Thank you so much for tuning into Pints with Aquinas. Hey, I want to say, if you haven't yet decided to support Pints with Aquinas on Patreon, maybe make that decision. (laughs) You know, if Pints with Aquinas is a blessing to you, if you're learning a lot from it, if it's drawing you closer to the Lord and you want to support this podcast because you want it to not only keep going, but to get better and better, go to pintswithaquinas.com and there you can just click donate and you can give whatever you want. You want to give a buck a month, I guess 12 bucks a year, can you afford that? Maybe two bucks a month, maybe 10 bucks a month. Whatever you give, I give you free stuff in return. And um, that'd be sweet, man. Thanks for thinking about it. Uh, also, if you want to review us on iTunes, we really appreciate getting your reviews. It's, it really helps us out a lot as well. And, you know, as I said in the beginning of this episode, we're giving away three copies of Carlo's book. All you got to do is share this episode on Twitter with the hashtag Pints with Aquinas. Thanks so much for listening. Bye.